Hello everyone, Assalamu alaikum. This is Muhammad Atif from Academia, year two of MBBS, uh, batch 27. And today we'll be talking about CBR observational research design. So uh, CBR, for those of you who don't know, is community-based research and it's a course done by um, our college here at the US College of Medicine, particularly for MBBS students. Uh, but you pretty much know what it is if you're here for this video, I guess. So let's go through it. Uh, this video will be covered by me, Muhammad Adif, and by Shah Mautaz and him. Starting uh, with the objectives, uh, I apologize for any sounds nearby. It's because I'm in House of Wisdom, shameless plug. It's a really great place to study. Anyways, so learning objectives. We'll be learning about the a general overview of the different types of medical research and then we'll differentiate based on some of them mainly the epidemiological study uh, types so here is a basic overview taken from dr amel's lecture uh, regarding uh, the types of medical research here we have primary research and secondary research and i'll go through with them and this is a uh, mind map basically cover so these scale uh, these types of research from basic which basically doesn't have uh, non uh, it has non-human subjects all the way to secondary research with meta-analyses which are considered the highest in the hierarchy which we'll be talking about there are also types of other types of classification including qualitative or quantitative and uh, other things which we'll get to, uh, to um, the following slides so uh, starting with the two main types of research uh, according to our lecture, we have qualitative and quantitative. So, basically from the name, qualitative research describes something unmeasurable. It's, for example, um, it's not a hard numbers. It's, not, it's just, it may be opinions, maybe, um, for example, cancer patients, we would like to see uh, the type of pain or the quality of pain or the severity of pain. Cancer patients are feeling uh, lung cancer patients, for example in their end stage um, in their end stage part of the disease so we would go to gather uh, this specific uh, population and then we would have uh, interviews with them and we would have focus groups so we would have gather all of uh, a sample for example one group of all of these patients together and then we would talk to them for hours actually it would go for a long time compared to uh, other studies and we would talk to them about uh, these uh, unmeasurable unmeasurable variables for example how do you feel um, how much is the pain things like that and um, we will not stop data collection unless we gather um, enough uh, answers that the answers start to be repeatable so that's when we know actually there are not much more answers we can get it's called data saturation so once we get that we get specific results so for example if i do this study here in uh, for example passing a hospital in the uae generally these results will be only limited to that population we cannot generalize these results as compared to quantitative research that's why it, have, it may be a bit weaker However, it can lead us to uh, formulate a questionnaire for quantitative research. What is quantitative research? It is measuring measurable variables. So we will have a questionnaire like the one we are doing in CBR, close-ended questions, basically agree, disagree, yes, no, one to five, etc. And uh, this data, which is measurable, we will collect it and form with it um, some ideas formulate formulate form so, <clears throat> sorry form from it some general generalizable findings that may be obtained and um, applied to other uh, samples or other uh, populations across the world similar to ours so we have larger samples because we do not care for the data saturation here or it's not applicable that's it's structured and it is used to identify relationships Finally, we have something known as mixed, uh, where we combine aspects of both, of both qualitative and quantitative. So, in terms of quantitative research, we have primary or secondary. 
So what does primary research mean? It basically means you are making a questionnaire or you are going into the field and collecting the data yourself. While secondary, you are taking data from previously made research from other researchers and you are compiling this data to make a simple review or a systematic review with, a meta, with or without a meta-analysis. So we will be focusing on primary research for our course. Uh, we have basic research, which is done on non-human subject, basically animal cells, genes, um, um, etc. Then we have clinical research, which can be experimental or observational. If clinical research is done on humans in the hospital generally, or in a clinical research center. And it can be experimental, i.e., for example, a clinical trial where you try a new drug, for example, the vaccines for COVID when they came out, there were clinical trials. And then we have observational clinical research in which uh, we collect data of an already known intervention or known cases and try to figure out more information about, for example, prognosis or diagnostic uh, capabilities, etc. Then we have epidemiological research, which is the focus of our studies. Um, it's done on the community as a whole, not on a specific um, clinical, uh, not on specific clinical cases or disease. So it can also be divided into experimental observ and observational. Experimental, you are testing an intervention on the community, a wide, uh, widely tested intervention. While observational, you observe what is already done or what is already there in the community. For example, a cross-section study, which we'll get there. And then we have secondary research, which is basically, we take the data from studies that are already made, and then we gather this data and try to formulate conclusions out of it. So because every single study has a conclusion, we can gather a group of studies about the same, the same topic and formulate a more strongly, um, a stronger conclusion about them. That's why they are um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which are the highest form of this, are the highest uh, type study in the research hierarchy, or evidence hierarchy, or evidence hierarchy. Then we have two more classifications. We have descriptive and analytical. So what descriptive means, basically, as it, as it says in the word, it aims to describe why something happens, or how it happens, and associations. For example, what does this cause that? Or does this, is this associate, is X associated with Y or not? And you give a hypothesis. Then when you get this hypothesis, you can test it in an analytical study. So you take the hypothesis, for example, I theorize that X causes Y, that obesity uh, leads to breast cancer, okay? So we would take this and test it by provi and provide explanation to the result we get at the end. Then we have case reports. Uh, so now getting deep into each type of them, we have case reports. So case reports, basically in your clinical studies, when you go inshallah to the hospital and uh, shadow doctors or become a doctor yourself, you may find an interesting case, like the one we have here, which is a three-man syndrome. It's really nice, you can read about it. It's nice information, but you can read about it. Um, interesting, I should say. And you find this rare case or a case that, or, or a disease that doesn't show up usually with these symptoms or doesn't usually show up because of um, with these outcomes, then you can write a report about it, take the chance and write a report about it and report it to the literature, uh, post it, and that would help future researchers and, uh, and doctors take what you have uh, mentioned in your report and try to study the disease more. You are giving data on that rare disease and helping the patients out eventually. Then you have case series where you have multiple cases of rare or unknown diseases and you try to find common factors or relationships among them. Following that, we have cross-sectional studies. So cross-sectional study basically means taking a section out of the population. So what does that mean? Taking a, or a snapshot, as, you, as they say, regarding uh, the population. So what that means is you don't take the whole population, you take a single or a group of individuals from the population and they are a randomized group in order to get the most uh, non-biased or accurate results. So you take a random people from the population you are trying to study and then you study them or take the data from them at one point in time. So you are not taking it over a duration from, or for, or for example, over five days or over one month. You are taking it at one specific moment. You gather them, take the data and that's it. That's what you work with. 
So these types of studies are used to measure prevalence of a disease and record associations, and they cannot calculate incidence. Because to calculate incidence, you have to follow up with patients. You have to have a period of time, and from, from point A to point B, there were this number of cases. We don't have a point A and point B here, we only have a point A. Thus, you cannot measure incidence. Um, it gives data regarding exposure and disease. So once you collect this randomized population, you start to see who got exposed to the risk factor you're studying. For example, you're studying a, a risk factor of disease, as we said, obesity and breast cancer, for example. You would see who is exposed to the risk factor and who is exposed to the, the disease. Who from the population has breast cancer and who from the population has obesity. Then you divide them into four, cry, four groups. Who has obesity and doesn't have breast cancer? Who has obesity and has breast cancer? Who doesn't have breast cancer and has obesity? And who doesn't have both? Or who has both? I may have messed up there, <laughs> but you get it. Um, anyways, however, uh, this type of study is not that great because we have some disadvantages. For example, chronic cases, they would have a higher prevalence because they last for a longer period of time. So they would be overrepresented. And acute cases would be underrepresented because they, the case usually finishes or the patient could die at, at the end and you will not be able to capture them in the population. So that's a problem and, and uh, it's shown here by this uh, best of picture with incidence, prevalence and mortality and recurrence. You can see um, what we mean here. Also, some diseases uh, cause the uh, members, cause the uh, patients of some diseases cause their patients uh, having to leave the community. For example, as, um, as the doctor mentioned, you have um, a chronic back pain. In chronic back pain, sometimes you want to study chronic, chronic back pain in, uh, in for example, uh, office workers. A lot of people from these office workers won't go to work because they have chronic back pain. They would have an excuse or they may be fired actually. Sadly, that sometimes happens. So you are underrepresenting the data. Finally, we have no temporality or causation. Basically, when we take this data, because it's a snapshot, as we said, only one point in time, we cannot know if the exposure or the risk factor happened first or the disease happened first. So we, do, we cannot determine if the risk factor caused the disease or not. We can only see an association. This might happen, this might cause to this, might lead to this. And you cannot ask the patient which came first because uh, the patient or the person in the population would often not uh, accurately interpreted, so it's called a recall bias. In terms of, in terms of ecological studies, um, it is simple. Instead of focusing on the individual as a unit of measurement or unit of analysis, we measure with the whole population. So basically, for example, we could have, it's the same idea. We have a risk factor X and a disease Y, okay? We won't see if risk factor X is correlated with having disease Y. So what should we do? Well, we take the whole population, for example, of a country, for example, the UAE. Okay, the whole population of the UAE who have uh, breast cancer, for example. So the whole breast cancer population of the UAE, and we see uh, the whole population of the UAE who smoke, for example. So we, and then we try to find a correlation. So we see, does a country that have people who smoke more also has people more people who have breast cancer or not and we would limit that to that woman of course um that's a generalization and um, that's a problem with it because you cannot uh, really suggest a relationship or you cannot say for certain that this a causes b that's called an ecologic fallacy why because in terms of the individual level, you cannot generalize the topic. For example, someone may be um, smoking for a long time, however, they may not develop breast cancer because they have other things that protect them. We cannot. That's why we cannot general. We cannot generalize the conclusions to, towards individual level. Um, we can only with ecologic studies. We can only suggest correlation. Uh, so we can say this may cause that or this may lead to that, but re more research should be done in order to actually fully understand whether A causes B. Finally, before ending, I would like to give you this um, really important picture that you would use a lot throughout your career. Uh, generally, 
if you want to be a good physician, you have to follow evidence-based medicine. And this is called basically um, the evidence hierarchy or the research evidence hierarchy. And what you do with it is basically at the bottom of this pyramid, you have the least um, evidence or the least accurate or not necessarily least accurate, um, the least strong or the weakest evidence. For example, expert opinion one, expert opinion one show a really strong evidence compared to a meta-analysis which is basically you take the whole you take the whole um, literature about a specific topic and then you study it and analyze it uh, critically appraise it and then you give it a common um, end result conclusion that would yani, for sure be, almost always be the, the correct one uh, as long as you have enough data so, the, so a meta-analysis is the strongest type of um, of uh, data that you can use in your uh, medical uh, your medical career. Finally, uh, again, last but not least, we have this beautiful summary. Shout out to the two K twenty three firm; they are really great for offering the CBR summary. You can check the QR code below. Hopefully, it works, and it will lead you to that summary where you can study this more in more detail. Thank you, and going on to my colleagues, which who will be explaining the rest of the lecture. Thanks so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Hind, and I'm going to explain the case control study. So we both, before we get started, let's analyze this picture. We can see what are the similarities between, there are two girls, right? So we can see they are similar in gender and similar in age, probably, and ethnicity, right? But what makes them different? What makes them different? The first girl, we can see that she has red spots on her face. And the second girl seems normal, right? So we can see that the case is the abnormal one. So when we're looking at the word case, case means the diseased person. Okay, and control means the non-diseased person. So what is the importance? Why do we want those groups to be similar? Why are we focusing on certain age groups, certain ethnicities, certain genders? Because we want to identify the risk factors, okay, the potential risk factors that made them develop this disease, right? Like, why did this girl get this disease? Is it because of her lifestyle? Is it because of her diet? What made her different from this control the non-disease girl what led her to this maybe family history so we need to identify this so this is why it's called an etiologic study because we want to identify the etiology of this disease which is basically the risk factors right maybe a smoker and so on okay an important thing i wanted to talk about is also you need to make sure of the group that you're choosing the control group the non-diseased people how can you make sure because there are specific rules uh the non-control group okay, uh, sorry the non-diseased people of the control group are we sure that they're totally healthy no they can have other diseases other conditions right so let's take the topic risk factors risk factors of smoking diet and lifestyle on the occurrence of cancer right so our case is going to be cancerous people people with cancer and the control is group is going to be people free of cancer okay let's say for example they have a disease you need to make sure this disease does not uh like act as a risk factor okay to cause cancer why? Because we don't want to pick people with diseases that uh, can act as risk factors because in our study, we're only focusing on the uh, smoking, diet, and lifestyle, you know, because we don't want our um, data to be mixed and confusing. We want it to be very accurate. So that's why this allowed diseases, for example, asthma, asthma cannot cause cancer. So this is a good control group. So you have to keep in mind when you are looking for the population you're trying to target, okay? Okay, now we're going to move on to the design of the case control study. So one thing you need to know about the case control study, it's actually called the retrospective, retrospective study. Why do they call it a retrospective study? 
it's very nice because you're trying to know the exposure in the past, right? What made the case, the diseased person, different from the control? Were they exposed to certain potential risk factors? Certain potential risk factors that led them to this? That's why we want the groups to be very similar. Again, we need them to be very similar so we can understand the topic further, understand this disease further. So we're going to look back in time. Okay, so we're going to look, were they exposed to smoking, for example, if we're talking about cancer, or were they not exposed to smoking? Also, the control groups, the non-disease, were they exposed or were they not? And in the case control study, you want to try so many risk factors. You don't want to just stick with few because you're trying to understand this case because we, we aren't sure of the risk factors. We aren't sure of the causes. That's why we keep saying potential, potential. That's why we're performing this research to understand uh, the risk factors more and the causes okay so now we're going to talk about furthermore on the design of the case control study we already talked about this graph the study population the cases are the diseased the controls are the non-diseased were they exposed or non-exposed for both right okay so what is the benefit of this why are we doing this so the benefit of the case control study, it's like the only study design to actually uh, calculate the prevalence. So if your topic or your research, okay, once you want to find the prevalence, then your go-to design is the case control study. Don't even try anything else. Why? Why is it that good? Because it it's, helps us find the potential cases, right? Because we are not sure of this, if this actually led to us led to this disease so that's why we're trying to find the potential risk factors which is only like achievable in a case control study especially with rare diseases so if, if you know that your disease is rare then automatically just stick with case control study because in case control study if you have rare disease you only need 50 control and 50 cases this is what the doctor mentioned so do, uh, it's not like from my head, you know, it doesn't need 500 participants because it's a rare disease, right? So what do you do? You go to hospitals, you search for cases, get a good control group and start your data collection to see the exposure and questioning, right? So always think rare disease, case control study. And for common, uh, for common, you can do case case control study and you can do also cross-sectional okay but for cross-sectional for rare disease it might be a bit difficult okay so yeah this is why it's very important it helps us find the prevalence the only case that helps us find the prevalence okay now i'm going to talk about the sources of the controls the two previous slides i've already explained so you can read them if you want separately so sources of the controls individual individual sources so we're talking about the case himself okay the diabetic person himself or the individual uh, non-diseased himself so we're going to specifically talk about recall bias so what's recall bias so you can't exactly recall so if we choose the case of a diabetic person and we choose the control group of a non-diabetic group if you ask them what was your diet in the previous one month the diabetic person will get, will tell you exactly what his diet was. But the non-diabetic person will be like, I don't even remember what I ate yesterday. So this can be a recall bias and it can affect your data and accuracy, you know. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, another thing I'm going to talk about is the individuals who have died. So right now, how can we get information about individuals who have died? So let's say we're talking about uh, individuals who have died uh, from COVID-19, okay? So you want to know why did they die. So our first group, which is our case group, is going to be individuals who have died of COVID-19. And the normal people is people who just died just during that specific time, let's say, okay? So now... By the way, my information might not be as correct. I, it's just for infor like demonstration purposes, just so you can get the full idea. So, sorry, this is control. So, okay. So, they are both dead. Both of them are dead. You cannot examine someone who died and someone who's still alive. No, that, that does not make sense, right? 
So right now you might be asking, how am I supposed to gather information if they're dead? You use the proxy interviews. What are proxy interviews? It's basically you, basically, <laughs> basically you interview family members, okay? You interview family members, for example, the most closest to them. So if it's a child, you would say the mother. If it's um, like a man, if he's married, then his wife, okay? Uh, so basically the person closest to them, okay? So let's say we're interviewing this person, the case, the person with the disease. We interviewed, let's say it's a man, we interviewed his wife, okay? Then you have to interview the wife for the control group, the non-diseased. You cannot interview the wife in the case and then you go interview the father in the non-diseased. No, you have to interview the same people so you can, so you can have accurate results okay you need accurate database you don't want anything missing this is exactly how it should be and you can't for example as i said you interview a uh, proxy interviews for someone who died uh with it like because of covid you interview his wife and then you go interview a wife of someone who didn't die in the control group no that doesn't make sense at all okay and you can get spe and you need to be very accurate with your uh you need to get you, know, you need to be very accurate with the the data for example you can look at death certificates or especially if it's a hospital it's a good advantage and they can give you all the information you know but for example sometimes it's a disadvantage because you don't know if they actually smoked or did drugs or I mean, had alcohol right and sometimes i think like the parents they don't want to say like i don't want to say my son smoked i don't wanna. Or sometimes they don't even know right so this is a disadvantage too for your data collection okay and now if we look at uh, individuals uh, attending the hospital or a clinic, it's very easy to find people, right? It's less expensive, easy to identify. As I said, uh, recall of controls is similar to recall of cases. Why? Because some uh, patients, like, you know, some hospitals, they keep clean records, you know, or for example, death certificate. Why did the, uh, this person like die? So you can have like accurate results, right? Uh, yeah. And now we're going to move on to the friends or relative identified by the cases. By the way, guys, if you don't understand, if you want a bigger picture, you can look at the recording uh, that Dr. Amel had. I think it's only 30 minutes to 40 minutes for this part, uh, but I'm just giving you the big idea. So friends or relative identified by the cases. Why are we looking at friends and relatives? For example, if you're a smoker, if the case is a smoker, and the control group, why is it a good benefit if it's a friend or a family member? Why? Why is it good? Because usually if you're a smoker, your friend might be a smoker. Might be. I'm not saying will be. Might be a smoker. So this can give you a good advantage, right? They, the family member, they will be the same race. Uh, a friend group, they might be the same age, education if they're with you in university, right? So those are good advantages. Uh, yeah and here we've already talked about the individuals who have died uh, the doctor didn't explain a lot but if your case focuses on uh, people who already died you can ask the doctor for more help but as we mentioned proxy interviews and you have to make sure about like the accurate the accuracy of the information You're asking the wife here you ask the wife there if for example wife one of the case wife one she knows more than the non, uh, uh, the non disease, which is the control. She knows more information than you. Your results won't be like that accurate. So you have to find questions where everyone will be able to answer, or you know, in a way where you have accurate results. And advantages of case control studies. We already talked about those. It's very important for rare diseases, especially or appear for a long time. Disadvantages. You can read them. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, uh, temporality. You we cannot determine if the exposure really happened before the disease uh, occurrence or not. For example, let's say we have person, uh, someone who has cancer. Okay, let's say they had cancer from ten years ago, but they weren't diagnosed. Diagnosed? No, they weren't diagnosed. Okay, and then after five years, they got diagnosed. So we're not sure if they started like smoking, for example, before like they had cancer or after they got diagnosed 
or before the, we're not the, we're not specifically sure we cannot prove the cause effect relationship you know that's why it can be a disadvantage okay and that's it for my part uh, if you have any questions you can talk to dr amal or you can ask me my name is hand and yeah thank you so much Hello everyone, I'm Shahad Murtaz and I'll be explaining cohort studies and nested case control studies. So before we start, let's just recap what was the main aim of the case control study. Case control studies aim to find the risk factors associated with a specific disease. And it's important to know that case control studies start off with a group of people that we know are diseased okay we know that they are diseased and what we want to find out is what are the risk factors that could possibly lead to this disease for example in breast cancer we are starting off with a group of women that already have breast cancer and we're looking back in time to check what are the risk factors associated with this um, cancer okay on the other hand cohort studies are completely the opposite now, what does cohort even mean? Cohort means a group of people that share a common characteristic. And in a cohort study, we're starting off with a group of people that are simply exposed to something that we want to find out a correlation between this exposure and a disease. So in short, we're trying to find out who will develop the disease? We're not trying to find out the risk factors because we already know the risk factors. The risk factors are the exposure. But what we're trying to find is who will develop the disease. In case control, we knew who developed the disease and we wanted to find out the risk factors. In the cohort study, which is what I'll be explaining in detail, we know the risk factors and we want to know who will develop the disease. And in a cohort study, we have three different types. We have prospective, retrospective, and ambidirectional. Now, prospective means that we are testing the subjects in real time, and we're going to be following up with them. On the other hand, retrospective is looking back in time to check for data. So we know and know our subjects right now in the present that they are or they have been exposed to something okay and we're going to look back and check at their check their data and everything and you're going to see and we're going to see who developed the disease based on the historical data that they will provide us with and ambidirectional essentially combines between the two now we're going to talk in a bit more detail about each type of cohort study. So first, let's start with the prospective one. The prospective cohort study aims to find out if the individual will develop a certain disease in the future based on certain risk factors that we already know. So today, for example, I gather a group of 50 middle-aged men that are all smokers. So this is the cohort. This is the group of people that share a common characteristic they are all smokers okay and we want to know if in the future in the next 30 years for example if they will develop atherosclerosis so we're going to be doing follow-up tests let's say every two years to know if they develop the disease or not and that simply summarizes what a prospective study is so we know the exposure but we do not know if they develop the, the, the disease or not this is what we want to know okay so the exposure or the risk factor is there and we want to know if this risk factor is associated with atherosclerosis. On the other hand, we have the retrospective or historical cohort. And this is where investigators will use pre-existing data to find if the patient will develop the disease or not, or if there is a relationship with it. And the best example over here is the Nagasaki bomb. So I'm pretty sure you guys know Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So let's say, for example, in, uh, we have a group of individuals that were all in the Nagasaki bomb or in this time. They were all exposed to the radiation. And we want to know if they developed any 
uh, disease, let's say lung cancer, for example. And this is where we're going to go back in time, not literally, we're going to go back in time, gather their medical records, gather anything that we can find, employment, medical records, and the time, the age, and maybe their proximity within the radiation and all of these risk factors. And we're going to see if they develop the disease or not. Okay, we're just going to correlate it. Again, the risk factor over here is the fact that they were in close proximity to the Nagasaki radiation. This is the risk factor. And we want to know if there is a correlation between this risk factor and the disease that is, in this case, lung cancer. The last type is ambidirectional. Now, ambidirectional, as I said before, combines between prospective and retrospective. Now, what we want, let's use the Nagasaki example again to make sense of it. So we're going to do the same thing we did in the retrospective. Okay, we're going to collect the data, everything from before. But the catch here is that we're going to follow up with them. We're going to follow up with the individuals if they develop lung cancer, because some of them might not develop it at this instant that you're doing the test in. And this is just going to give you better data, uh, although it does take more time, but it's going to be a lot more accurate. So you're going to keep on following up with the subjects, whether or not they develop lung cancer. And that essentially summarizes retrospective, prospective, and ambidirectional. Now let's get to understand what are the advantages and disadvantages of cohort studies. First of all, you're going to be able to calculate the absolute risk or incidence. You're going to be taking into account the risk factor and whether or not this patient will develop a disease. So you're going to know exactly the correlation between them and get the incidence. Second of all, there will be no recall bias. And this is really good since especially in the prospective and ambidirectional study, you're going to be gathering the medical data on your own every once in a while. So you're not really depending on the patient or subject to recall information. Lastly, you're going to be knowing the relationship between the exposure and the disease on a really big scale, which is really nice. Next, let's talk about the disadvantages. So the disadvantages over here mostly apply to prospective studies and ambidirectional, since, uh, as you can see, they can be time consuming and expensive. For example, if we're tracking a um, study over a 30 year span, obviously this is not the best. Next, it's also impractical for rare diseases since you need a large cohort. Um, cohort, again, a group of people that share the same characteristic. So it might not be that easy to find something for rare diseases. Also, it's um, really easy to lose follow-up. You know, a lot of patients might have different circumstances, moving around and so on. The very important disadvantage over here also is exposures may change over time. So an example for this case would be in the smoking and atherosclerosis study, let's say one of the men decides to stop smoking. So over here, this man has to be removed from the whole data set. Lastly, ethical issues can arise, especially if the risk factor is harmful. So if you're testing out smoking and you're kind of telling them to continue smoking, um, this might be an ethical issue. Or for example, if you're testing out people that are um, working in a factory with chemicals and so on. So that can be an ethical issue that may arise. Now let's talk about nested case control studies. Now this type of study basically combines between cohort and case control. In cohort, which is the one I just explained, we wanted to find out who will develop the disease based on the risk factors. And in case control, we wanted to find what are the risk factors. Okay, so over here, I have an example which will hopefully clear everything up. So we have a thousand newborns that were born on November 2020. And 30 years later, they develop cancer. Half of them develops cancer and the other half doesn't. Okay. Now, I want to know if there is a correlation between the fact that a thousand of these babies that were born in this specific hospital 
um, why did half of them develop this type of cancer? Okay, now I already know the outcome. I already know and know half of them developed cancer. I know who developed it and everything. So since I know the outcome, this is a case control study. Okay, this is, or this is the case control part of the study. Okay, we know the outcome. We're depending on it. Okay, now we want to know the risk factors or if there is a correlation between the fact that they were born here, the exposure part, and the outcome. And this is where the cohort part comes into hand. So the cohort part is the fact that they all share the same exposure. They all share the fact that they were born in this hospital, in this specific time, in this specific place, and so on. So this is the cohort part. And in nested case control studies, the cohort is often very defined or refined. It makes it even better and more accurate. For that essentially explains the nested case control study. I also want to bring to your attention something that might confuse some people. Now, some people are going to be like, um, how is the case control different from the retrospective one? Since the case control is also a retrospective study. But as I mentioned a couple times, in case control, we're depending on the outcome. But in a retrospective study, we're depending on exposure. We're depending on the risk factors. We know the risk factors and we want to know who will develop the disease. But in case control, we know the outcome, we're depending on the outcome, and we want to know what are the risk factors. So I hope this clears everything up. Make sure to tell me if you have any questions and thank you so much.